Hello, welcome to worship. So glad to be able to connect with you and uh, allow you to connect with us in this virtual capacity uh, as each week we continue to offer a virtual format of worship. Uh, and uh, we encourage you to continue to utilize this mode of worship if you believe that is the best for you and your family at this point in time. Uh, just a reminder, as I will continue to do, we are providing in-person worship in the church sanctuary each Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And uh, we are doing our best to abide by all the most current uh, Center for Disease Control guidelines uh, to make that as safe an experience as we know how to, uh, how to make it. Uh, with that in mind, though, as I've said, we encourage you to utilize whatever mode of worship you believe is best for you. With that in mind, I would like again to uh, remind us of the things that unite our hearts together. We may see the world very differently from uh, different perspectives, but in terms of our faith, there is a great unity, and that unity is reflected in this common confession that pretty much every week I invite us to read together. So let us once again read together what we know as the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My chains are gone, I've been 
set free. My God, my Savior's ransom me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns unending love, amazing So what exactly is a call to worship, and why do we include it in each of our worship services? Well, the answer to that question is, has to do, or is rooted in the nature of God himself and the relationship that he desires to have with you and with me. It is a relationship where he does not insist on some sort of subservient recognition of his power and his greatness. It is an invitation to connect with him as our Heavenly Father. Depending upon where we find ourselves emotionally or spiritually at any given worship experience, we may come into that experience from a little bit different place. But God always calls us and invites us into worship. He never forces it upon us. The call to worship each week is an opportunity to reflect upon specifically what is God inviting us to experience during this particular worship service. And so each and every week, I like to use the call to worship time for that end and invite you yet again to read with me these words of invitation and call to today's worship. Give thanks to God. We thank God for joy, for laughter, for abundant blessings of every kind. Give thanks to God at all times and for everything. We thank God when we can and as we can for struggles, for solitude, for fears. Give thanks to God at all times and for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, we thank God that in Christ, our joys as well as our pain, our losses as well as our laughter are in God's heart and God's hands. Well, a very special welcome to our younger worshipers. So glad that you've joined us today. And this segment of our worship experience each and every week is given over to hopefully a, a lesson using a familiar object to underscore a spiritual principle. And it may be for those of you that uh, are young in age or for those of us that uh, are merely young in heart. I, I hope that these little lessons give us a handle on something important from the scriptures. Today I've brought with me something very, very important, particularly in this uh, Florida heat that we all experience, and that is a nice cold bottle of water. Uh, this particular bottle of water just came out of the refrigerator, so it's nice and cold, and uh, so when I get thirsty, uh, it's right here, all packaged, ready for me to go, and... Mmm. So good. You know, when, when I get hot and I'm thirsty, uh, some people prefer a soda, some people iced tea, whatever the case may be, and that's perfectly fine. But nothing for me quite is as good as a cold bottle of water, because after all, that's really what our body is asking for. You see, when we're thirsty, it tells us something. It tells us that our body needs more water. Uh, it could be more water because we've been working out in the heat and our body perspires and gets rid of water. And because of that, we, we need to refill. We need to replenish the amount of water in our body. And our body signals to us that need by making us thirsty. And, and if we don't very quickly uh, meet that need, the body's going to make us even more thirsty. You know, the Bible talks about being thirsty for God. Just like our physical bodies need water to keep them healthy and to replenish the water that we might lose. So it is in our relationship with God. We need God's spiritual water as well. The Bible says, or Jesus said in the Bible, 
that uh, he is living water, uh, which means that when we get to know Jesus, it's like uh, providing water for our souls, for our inner self. And so getting to know Jesus is one way that we replenish our need for spiritual nourishment. How do we get to know Jesus? Well, primarily in this day and age, uh, we get to know him by reading the Bible, his word, by uh, attending church services and, and uh, experiencing what it means to be with God and with others, uh, by praying together and doing any number of those activities. But there are all ways that uh, we can experience Jesus' presence in our lives and experience him as our living water, our spiritual water, if you will. Something to think about. I look forward to spending uh, these moments in prayer with you during worship every week. I know for so many of us, our prayer requests are many and varied. Uh, in some cases, uh, some of you are going through a very intense trial right now, and that might come from another direction, be it health, be it physical circumstances. May it be the fear of something that uh, you might fear coming down the road in the future. Uh, for some of us, our hearts are filled with praise. We've seen God's hand at work in a marvelous way this week, and we just want to tell God how much we thank him for breaking through uh, into an experience where we've experienced and seen firsthand his power and his grace. And of course, we have everything in between all those. So with that in mind, I, I invite us to pray. First of all, I invite us to pray by uh, taking a few moments and just simply allowing you to uh, unclutter your mind and clutter your hearts and perhaps lift to God whatever personal requests you have for him this morning. They might be for you, they might be with a, for a friend or a loved one, but this is your time to basically use and reflect and to pray to God. Following that, I will offer a prayer for each and every one of us and we'll close as we so often do with a reminder of the pattern of prayer that Jesus taught us when he provided for us what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Let us go to prayer. Almighty God, we come before you in uh, reverence for who you are and your great power and your amazing grace that you've extended to each and every one of us. Father, we come before you with thanksgiving for whether it is in the present or in the past, we've in so many ways experienced your hand at work in our lives and the lives of our family and friends. Father, we also come with a sense of expectancy for as we pray, we recognize that some of these requests that we bring before you today are requests that we've been bringing for a while. And at least from our side of things, we're not really sure how or if you have yet responded. We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to ways that you may choose to respond to our prayers that defy our own comprehension or expectations. Help us to see your hand at work in ways that we might nor normally see your hand at work because well, we've looked for that to happen in a very specific way, and you want to lead us outside of that box and demonstrate that you are Lord God over all areas of life and not just the ones that we select. Father, we do pray for those in our church family this day who are hurting, who are in need of your healing, who are in need of your provision, who are in need of just a reminder that you're still there who are in need of uh, the basic necessities of life. We, we thank you for those that we are able to serve through our food pantry and through our upcoming yard sale. And Father, we pray that these practical acts of loving kindness might result in people observing within us a heart and a spirit of those who belong to Jesus Christ and might be encouraged to seek him along the way in their own lives as well. Father, uh, particularly pray for the Osef family this week, who Harry, their husband and dear father, has passed into your presence. And while we rejoice in the hope of resurrection, Father, we recognize that we have an earthly grief that is real and needs healing. 
We pray that would be, care, uh, be the case for them as well as for all others this day who continue to grieve as we have had to let go of the earthly presence of someone we know and care about so deeply and, and trust them into your eternal existence. Father, we pray for our church as we continue to find our way through this time of pandemic, which, Lord, it seems like uh, sometimes we know things are where things are going, and then the next day we, we get news that things aren't quite as what we hoped they would be. Lord, grant us patience, but most of all, look, grant us trust in you, that you and your mercy and your grace and your kindness will see us through. Father, with that in mind, we recognize that you've given us a pattern for prayer for all these things. And I invite us all to reflect and to offer it to, uh, offer it to you together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Tithes and offerings. This is one of the more tangible ways that we tell God that we love him and we participate in the work of his church. And so once again, I just encourage you to continue to support God's work as he should so lead you uh, in the uh, giving of your tithes and offerings that Mariner United Methodist Church can continue to serve the Lord and be a haven of peace and rest for those seeking a connection with God and with one another. I thank you and give you praise uh, for your commitment to the Lord, uh, and I do so on behalf of the entire Mariner uh, family. Uh, just a reminder that uh, in order to uh, give your tithes and offerings, uh, one means is through our electronic giving option that uh, you will find uh, a link for at our church website, marinerumc.org, uh, or you can mail or bring your tithes and offering here to the church itself, whichever you feel best suits you. With that in mind, allow me to pray God's blessing upon each gift and each giver. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can present to you our tithes and offerings, that you in your mercy and grace do use them to exercise uh, your work on earth. Father, we thank you for ways that we've experienced this in the past. We pray you give us wisdom for our opportunities to know how to do it in the future. For we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Alone are the real joy giver and 
A few moments ago during our young worshiper moment, uh, I held up uh, this bottle of water, and uh, it's still pretty cold, pretty refreshing, and uh, uh, still like to turn to it during uh, my times of dryness and mm, get a really nice long drink of some cold water. You know, as I do that, and as I did it earlier, I may have made you a little bit thirsty as well, and at some level, I apologize for that, but maybe not completely. Why is that? Because experiencing physical thirst uh, is something that reminds us that we ought also to have a spiritual thirst as well. And uh, we're going to be looking at a passage of scripture uh, that reflects one person's thirst for God. It is a passage of scripture from the book of Psalms. It is the second in a series that we have entered into uh, in the book of Psalms. Uh, looking to the Psalms, particularly as uh, an example of the book of, the, uh, of a section of scripture, particularly good for feeding our souls. And today, maybe uh, the more apt analogy is to give water to our souls, even a period, in a period of dryness. Now, in this series, we're not going to look at all 150 Psalms, but we are going to select a few. And I mentioned last week that there are five general basic themes that you will find throughout the book of Psalms. And each and every Psalm may not have all five of these, but it'll usually have at least one or two. Today's Psalm is no exception. Uh, I remind us again that those uh, themes are the theme of identification. In other words, uh, the Psalm is something that uh, we can identify with the writer. Uh, the theme of confession, of uh, telling God and confessing our needs and our sins to God. The theme of reconciliation, of experiencing a God who reconciles himself to us and forgives our sins. Uh, the theme of anticipation, anticipating what God is going to do that maybe he has not yet done. And the theme of determination, to continue to follow God even when the life gets, uh, excuse me, the road gets a little bit rough. So with that in mind, we're going to turn today to a sermon that teaches us a little bit about what it means to thirst for God. It is the 42nd Psalm, and it reads like this. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people are saying to me all day long, where is your God? 
These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. In that psalm, I believe we find at least three of the themes that I mentioned a little earlier. The first off, very clearly, is the theme of identification. The writer of this psalm is obviously going through a, an experience that you and I experience as well as we seek to be a devoted follower of Jesus Christ, as we seek to worship God and be consistent in our lives before him. He is experiencing a time when uh, his soul is downcast. Uh, downcast literally means to feel the weight of burden on our back and has pushed him down. And uh, the writer reflects upon this and, and realizes because of that, they're in a period where they are thirsting for God. Life just seems a bit parched. And who hasn't had that experience? Any devoted follower of Christ knows that there are seasons in our spiritual life where these times of dryness might come on and these, these times of downcastness, if you will. And so this is an easy psalm to identify with because the writer reflects well, reflects our own experience as well. The fact that they are downcast uh, points out at least uh, a couple of things that are mentioned in the passage for the reasons behind that. One is they're going through a season of dryness, and so they are thirsty. Particularly, they're thirsty for God. So thirsty that they compare it to a deer who is having trouble finding a stream to drink from. And so they begin to pant, their tongue begins to hang out, if you will. The thirst has become a bit intense. And uh, this thirst reflects a dry period that they're going through. Now, sometimes dryness is due to a lack of water. The writer of the psalm may have experienced a period of time where, for whatever reason, it just doesn't seem like uh, the words of scripture, the living water of our Lord Jesus Christ, feet is quite like they normally do. Now, there's probably a number of reasons why that might be the case. Quite often, God is trying to lead us in a different direction. But nevertheless, lack of water is obviously can be a reason for dryness. And it may be because maybe we've neglected feeding our souls a bit. You know, scientists and medical folks will tell us that the human body, the physical human body, uh, can survive a lot longer without food than it can without water. Both are essential, and both eventually will cause our demise if we don't have one or the other, but lack of water tends to speed up the process a bit. Uh, a bit. And with that in mind, dryness can be a very uncomfortable thing, particularly if it goes on for an extended period of time. And who hasn't experienced what it means to be thirsty? And so one of the reasons why our souls might become downcast is we're in a dry period due to lack of water. What's the solution? Well, water. We need to take some time to re-reflect upon God's scripture, to recommit ourselves to worship, and uh, do those things which will allow our soul to be fed, which leads me to the second thing that might be causing dryness, and that is excessive effort. This often is more the case, I think, for most of the believers I know, that we have become so wrapped up in serving Christ that we've maybe neglected a bit the feeding of our own souls. We have expended ourselves so much and so often on behalf of others that we've depleted our own spiritual reserve, our own spiritual well. And so excessive effort can cause us uh, to experience a period of dryness with God that comes on over a period of time and we begin to realize how thirsty we are. You know, if I go out in my yard and work this time of year in Florida especially, I'm going to perspire quite a bit. I'm going to get more thirsty. And if I don't replenish you know, I'm in danger of something like heat stroke or, or, or even worse. And uh, when we are excessively uh, putting forth effort and service to others without replenishing our own soul, well, that can create, create dryness as well. In addition to dryness, though, the downcastness that this psalm uh, is reflecting is uh, due not only to a dry period of time, but to criticism as well. This person is being ridiculed for their commitment to Christ, or at least it's being challenged. And uh, others are looking at their predicament and saying, ha, 
Where is your God now? And if you're such a great person of faith, why are you not trusting in him as you should? These are some of the comments that are coming toward this writer of Psalm from, ex, um, from uh, external sources. And that criticism over a period of time can bring our soul down and begin to deprive us of a sense of God's presence and God's grace. And so as we look at this downcastness and the dryness and the criticism this Psalm uh, was reflecting to us, who among us can say we've not been there ourselves because we have? What's the important thing to remember there? And I think I've already said it. it's important that others have been down that road and they've written about their experience so that we know that we're not alone. Speaking that we're not alone. The other element, the other theme, if you will, from the Psalms that I see reflected here is not only the theme of identification, but the theme of anticipation. And in this theme, the writer looks forward to a time when they will yet again offer praise to the Lord. They're seeking God, they are thirsty for God, but uh, they're looking forward to a time when they can renew their praise of God and they believe that will happen in time. And what is fueling that anticipation? Well, they reflect upon something very, very important. The importance of connection, the importance of connection with others. They reflect upon the time when they used to be able to go to the house of God. I read that passage and I thought, wow, maybe they were in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic as well, where uh, their buildings were shut down and inaccessible. We're really not sure why the writer was not able to participate face-to-face -face in worship with folks, but the writer remembers that time and he remembers that there are others out there just like him, just like them who are experiencing a period of dryness. And when we're going through a period of time where our soul is downcast, feeling a bit of dry, when we're experiencing the challenge and criticism of those who might mock our faith, we are fueled, I think, at times to remember that we are not alone in this process. There are others experiencing it as well. And so uh, while we can't experience that connection quite as well in a virtual capacity, it's, it's our experience to try to provide some means of reminder that you're not alone even as you worship virtually from the safety of your home. And then the final element, in addition to identification, in addition to anticipation, that I think is reflected in this particular psalm, is uh, the element of determination. After all is said and done, the psalmist challenges himself. The writer challenges themselves to say, I am going to put my faith in God. I'm going to put my hope in God. That's a decisive decision. Despite all the reasons I might have not to, despite the criticism, the dryness, all that's going on in my life right now, I'm going to make a decision, and that is I'm going to put my hope in God. In the original Hebrew language, that little word hope means to wait with expectation. In other words, hope is uh, defined by something that we expect and are waiting to happen that has not yet happened but we are assured will happen even though we don't know the timetable. Kind of like the return of Jesus Christ. Or something a little more earthly, it's like sitting at a red light or sitting in traffic when traffic is backed up. You know, when I'm sitting at a red light or when traffic is backed up and I'm in a hurry to get somewhere and I want to get there fairly soon, it's easy to be annoyed. And uh, in the case of uh, a traffic jam, I may be annoyed at those who didn't build the road big enough or at those who maybe had caused an accident someplace up in front of me. And, and so I'm forced into a situation where I have to wait. But if I stop and remind myself that I'm not only waiting, I'm waiting with expectation. Oh, my timetable has probably just been changed. I'm not gonna receive or get where I'm going as soon as I would have liked to or as soon as I had planned. And my plans may need to change in light of that. I may need to make a phone call and tell somebody I'll be arriving late or may have to postpone something that I had planned to be at at a particular time. But nevertheless, I know there will be a time when the traffic is gonna clear and once again, I will be able to move forward. That's the way it is with the psalmist. He's saying right now I have to wait, but I'm waiting with expectation. I am waiting with the expectation that in whatever time frame God should so choose, that these circumstances are once again, once again going to move me into a place of praise. Usually when that happens, 
we've learned a few lessons along the way. And we learned to praise God in circumstances that maybe before that time, we didn't consider to be very praiseworthy. But in light of this psalm, we have encouragement here to hope in God and to make the conscious decision to wait expectantly. And so, is your soul downcast today? Are you experiencing dryness? Are you experiencing criticism? The writers experience the same thing. You're not alone. And there will come a time when we'll be back together, but reflect upon the fact that you're not alone. And put your hope, put your hope solely and fully in God. You know, there's so many things in this world that disappoint us, not so much with God. God bless you today. I've enjoyed worshiping with you so very much and trust that you'll have a wonderful day in Christ. God bless. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul.